What is up, everyone? Welcome to this week's Nerdball Fantasy Football Show. I am your humble host and dendrologist specializing in the conservation of the endangered Robert Woods and astronaut aboard the Pitts 8 Moon Expedition, Pete Rogers. And I am joined uh, this episode by my fellow nerds. We have the duck father and runner-up in the great Russell Wilson cooking show, resident old man Clark Barnes, and devout follower of the Anthony Lynn running back gospel and founder and lone member of the Devontae Adams' average club, the ginger woodsman Nick Botterford. How are we doing, everyone? Doing great, Pete. We're good, Pete. How are you? I am good. As this is an audio medium, uh, you probably hear there's a, a slight rasp to my voice. Uh, I was, Becca and I went out back to Boston this weekend to uh, attend my sister's bachelorette party, which let me tell you, it is very difficult to keep up with 26 year olds who imbibe regularly when you are 30 and have not imbibed in a long time. And so going to bed at 3.30 in the morning uh, after crushing a bunch of Trulies and champagne and the whole nine yards has left me with a, a slight rasp. I think it adds something. I think it just makes me a little more, uh, you know, desirable from an audio area. Speaking of who couldn't keep up with who those Browns gave the chiefs a run for their money on Sunday. I just like to see if I can push. How far can I push into the show before Clark feel before Clark has a perfect transition into talking football? Until I get awkward and I'm like, let's stick to sports. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, we have lots to talk about this week, as it is the conclusion to week one, the first week of the NFL. Uh, we are going to talk about week one overreactions that we actually believe we're going to give out. Uh, some top waiver wire ads. But before we do all of that, let us hit the news. And unfortunately, as this becomes more and more regular and as the season goes on, the news section really just becomes the injury report section. And unfortunately, we do have some pretty big injuries to start the year, uh, starting out in Denver with Jerry Judy out with a high ankle sprain. Uh, and I, I have seen now, I think there is a timeline now, and it, it seems like it's a four to six weeks um, and this is obviously a big blow to fantasy manager, fantasy managers and the Broncos offense, uh, Nick, but, uh, what are your, what are your feelings with this, with this injury going down this early? Well, it, it seemed like Teddy, like really looked to the tight ends. Uh, he, he was going after Fant, And then I think it was Albert awkward Boonham that ended up catching like his, his, uh, yeah, his red zone touchdown. Um, and I, so I don't know that Judy's absence is actually going to lead to an uptick in usage for, you know, who I would hope for Cortland Sutton, uh, Teddy might just be going after like the large, <laughs> easy to see guys in, in the two tight ends. And even Tim Patrick was involved. He went four for four 39 and one touchdown. Um, Judy, I believe, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's supposed to be out between like four and six weeks. So which is great because th that thing looked aw it looked so much worse than like a high ankle sprain is not great, but it looked like his ankle like bent backwards and sh like exploded into a billion pieces um, from from the tackle and from the footage. So while you you don't want a uh, you know uh, an injury this early, the, the fact that it is something that won't end his season and won't mean he needs to recover from it uh, is or you know have to have to get surgery and recover from it is a good is a good thing as we look for silver linings here. Um, I, I do want to mention, uh, I watched Teddy Bridgewater a ton last year in Carolina. Don't ask me, you know, sorry. Hey, you're a Teddy and, Bridgewater and then, fan. Nothing wrong with that. And then what we saw uh, this week in Denver was the same thing. Uh, I, Nick, you're very, very close. I think he targeted the tight ends a lot of times because those were the kind of easy throws and easy routes um, Jerry Judy was running a lot of those routes, and that's why um, we saw 2,000-yard receivers from the Carolina Panthers last year in very unspectacular form because he'll just make that easy throw over and over and over again. And so we saw that again with the, the Broncos. So it's kind of stating the obvious, but it's good to state those known knowns 
And that's why I'm excited about big body Tim Patrick coming in relief of Jerry Judy, because he should align with what Teddy Bridgewater likes to do. Tim Patrick, who like had a good season last year as, as a very <laughs> underrated pass catcher in the Broncos offense, four for four, like, uh, and 39 yards and a touchdown, 30% rostered on sleeper. Um, so he's, he is definitely a guy who I would be targeting on waivers. We'll obviously get into like our whole list of guys who we're excited about, but Tim Patrick is certainly a, a person to target given the fact that that role is now opened up with Judy gone for an extended period of time. Yeah, Tim Patrick's going to start for some team yeah. next year. He's just been buried on the Broncos wide receiver death track. Uh, more bad injury news. The 49ers backfield, man. It is both blessed with Kyle Shanahan calling plays and just hyper-efficiency and success, but there is also a large curse looming over it with Raheem Mostert now out eight weeks, and that has been confirmed with a uh, – cartilage in his knee being clipped i think or, or something that sounds awful <laughs> not at all an injury that you want uh obviously terrible for both him and the 49ers uh but nick sorry actually nick already went to you so ignore you clark this isn't the sign of, of trey sermon season though uh is it so we don't know uh, Trey Sermon was a healthy scratch, and in the waiver wire article I wrote, I put that in hypoth or parenthetical quotes of healthy scratch. I think it, we're like a week or two removed from Trey Sermon getting metal removed from his finger. So I, I wonder if perhaps there was some overlap of Kyle Shanahan knowing the Lions are not going to be good. And so we're just going to sit. Who, who probably our number two running back is, but I feel really good about our three and four guys. So I'm just going to let Sermon uh, sit. And that, that is the only reason I'm not, I don't want to gild the lily here, but why I'm not all in on Elijah Moore is because I think maybe Sermon just got kind of a like quote unquote veteran recovery day. I have no idea if that's true and no one's talking about it, but it makes sense to me. The Raheem Mostert <laughs> injury is why people say, Players are injury prone. It, it just, I don't know if that's true or not, but he's had a rough run of it. And last year we learned the Niners have a pretty good stable of running backs. And when one of them goes down, they are able to replace that production fairly easily. Q Elijah Mitchell. There's a lot of Elijahs in this year's draft class. I'm trying to keep them straight. <laughs> Q Elijah Mitchell of the Ragin' Cajuns of Louisiana. Uh, We'll talk more on him later, but he came in and, and looked good. He had one big run for a touchdown that was like 40 yards, but then ended the day with 100 plus yards and a touchdown. So on 18 other carries, picked up 60 other yards and, and looked okay. Yeah. I, so Clark, hit me with that again. Were you saying that Sermon is the one who is having metal removed from his finger? Yes. No, yeah, it's Trey. I I believe. It was Trey Lance who had the, the procedure, was it not? Well, okay, I believe you. I go to Nick for all of my medical questions. Well, yeah, I thought I thought that it was uh, it, Lance like banged his finger on a helmet in uh, in the preseason, so he, he missed a uh, a week. It so the the news reports and what I have seen like people trying to read between the lines with Sermon is he played really badly in the practices after. We saw him in the preseason, like crush it in the preseason. Um, Eli Mitchell, I, he had some special teams viability. And so Kyle Shanahan wanted him on the roster there. To me, this whole thing seems punitive. And I wonder if this is, uh, I don't recall who it was, but a couple of people. Oh, uh, Rich Rebar was pointing out the fact that this is like the third or fourth guy that Kyle Shanahan has intervened in the draft process and said we are taking this guy this is my guy joe williams and dante pettis were two others um and they basically had like uh, attitude problems or like kind of like a the mental side of things was not all there and the way that he chose to deal with it was to like punish them or publicly say crappy things and it did not work out and so my what i've what I am piecing together here, at least like from a concern perspective, is that Trey Sermon maybe kind of went to his head. The, the fact that he knew that the coach intervened during the draft and said, hey, this is my guy and, and he might even be the starter. And I don't know, maybe he coasted in practice. Um, 
but it, it this reads as punitive to me. Of course, Raheem Mostert's injury now muddies the waters even more because we're not like I am certain that Trey Sermon is going to be active this week because Mostert is going to be inactive. And that like Dr. Edwin Porras was talking about the uh, the cartilage chip thing and basically said that's not a thing. Um, it might be a meniscus tear. And, and he was quote tweeting David Lombardi, who is just like, I, I have gotten into it with him on Twitter. I think he's more of a name writer than a reporter, but. Um, Shots fired, Nick Badford. I, I, yeah. Anyway, um, I don't think we're going to get to know now if Sermon would have been active because they're just forced into this situation. Mm. So there's like less clear, even though Sermon will probably be active, I think there's less clarity as to what exactly is going on in the backfield. But Eli Mitchell, I I dropped Levy on in a couple of leagues to pick you him up. You have right to go get him. Yeah. Like you have to get Eli Mitchell. You can't just let him sit on the waiver wire if you have the opportunity because of the fact, like, and it's not just the fact that like Trey Sermon might be in the doghouse or whatever that situation is. It's also the fact that Eli Mitchell, like his 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 numbers uh, from a speed wise, test exactly like Raheem Mostert. He is that super speedy guy who can take the ball with any touch and, and, you know, turn it into a 40 yard touchdown. Like what we saw against the lions and that's what Raheem Mostert is. And Raheem Mostert was the guy who beat Matt Breida out to take this back. Like, it's just that, that guy who's hyper athletic and with, with breakaway speed has kind of won Kyle Shanahan's backfield more often than not. And Trey Sermon doesn't offer that. It is very, and we'll move on from the news, but like, it's very interesting to me. The fact that coming out of week one of this 49ers can't uh, 49ers team, we are hearing Trey Sermon and Brandon Ayuk are both guys who seemingly are being punished for something, which is just, I, it's not great. It's not great. I want to this the 49ers backfield is probably the biggest, or I think it's the biggest story of, of week one going into the waiver wire. So yeah. I, I think we, I, I want to dedicate a little bit more time. To this. Yeah. Uh, so doing a little research on Mitchell before this came in, you know, Nick and I are in a, uh, FFPC best ball draft together. And I think we drafted Mitchell like super, super late because Matt Waldman talked about him. I did that in some league. It doesn't matter. Um, Mitchell was compared by Matt Waldman to Tevin Coleman. And so a lot of people may see that as a positive, but I, I don't want to put words in Matt Waldman's mouth, but that's not really a positive because Tevin Coleman's a very stiff runner. He's a straight line runner and he's not especially dynamic, which is exactly what we saw when mm. Mitchell had a huge hole nailed it. No one's going to catch him totally housed it. But then he had several carries where he had to make a decision and didn't really look fantastic. He looked like he could play a really good uh, second man up role in that offense with that moster, just take it to the house speed. I still think it's going to be Trey Sermon who when the dust settles ends up as the leading rusher for the 49ers, because I think Sermon is while not as fast or athletic as Mitchell is on paper. I think he's a, a better running back. But having said that, now that we're hearing that he's perhaps in trouble, which is my favorite word for adults is being in trouble. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter what we think. If the coach doesn't like the guy, well, that's a huge, huge red flag for face. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the news. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, the quarterback for the Washington football team, has been placed on IR and is out six to eight weeks with a hip injury. Uh, Taylor Heineke came in and actually played pretty well. Uh, 11 for 15, 122 yards and a touchdown. And per Patty's QPI rating uh, over on NerdballFF.com, graded out as a you know top five uh, quarterback for Sunday's main slate. Um, now, no moves are being made as of right now. Uh, Heineke is going to get the start moving forward, which Clark and I had chatted about this on Twitter today. seems like Cam Newton is like a pretty fantastic fit here and whether or not Ron Rivera moves him, uh, go, you know, makes moves to bring Cam in, it would make a lot of sense. But uh, Nick, how does this impact your, your faith in Washington's pass catchers with the uh, quarterback switch moving forward? I, I mean, with like this next week, this is brutal Thursday night McLaurin. against the Giants. That's a quick turnaround for yeah. So they yeah. so they have to have the quick turnaround, and then they have to go against like a, a pretty solid defense. Terry McLaurin's probably going to be shadowed by James Bradbury, who's not like Darrell Revis, but he's really good. He is totally shut down. I, th I think he shut down like DK Metcalf last year. He 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 can play. Um, 
So I looked over like what Tyler Heineke has done in his last two starts, which one was in uh, last year, 2020 or not start, but he played significant time in the fourth quarter. Like he, I was surprised by his raw counting stats just for playing one quarter um, in, in relief of uh, Dwayne Haskins. Um, and then another time in 2018 when he was still with Carolina and he got real banged up in that one, but that's kind of his, his style of play. He's a scrambler, you know, pass if he, if he can find someone, but he basically just locks onto like two guys, may, maybe three, but he likes the short area guys. So Logan Thomas and Curtis Samuel and Christian McCaffrey while he was in, or no, uh, Curtis Samuel and Christian McCaffrey when he was in Carolina. And then uh, last year, Logan Thomas, uh, Steven Sims, slot receiver, and uh, J.D. McKissick. So he just, he locks onto the guys who like when they line up are just right next to him. <clears throat> um, Logan Thomas dominated slot routes this week. He had 18. Uh, a couple guys had like 10 and 11, uh, you know, being Diami Brown and Adam Humphreys. And then Terry McLaurin might've had nine, I think. But I think like I'm looking to start other people over Terry McLaurin. I, I think that he's a risky flex play this week. I don't think I'm looking to start Tyler Heineke because of the fact that uh, or Taylor Heineke rather um, because this is a really tough defense, but uh, Antonio Gibson, I mean, I'm not going away from him. He got, he got that, uh, uh, he dinged his shoulder, but it's not expected to keep him out. And I think that they're just going to like, just ride that backfield. And, and it was awesome seeing JD McKissick get like three touches last week. Like this is, this looks now like this might actually be Gibson's backfield. So uh, like, like it for the backfield, do not like it for Terry McLaurin. Yeah, Gibson uh, was one of my top props, uh, prop bets this week. I'm doing an article each week for two of my favorite. batting a thousand with those. Two of my favorite player props. I had Mike Davis at 65. This is per DraftKings Sportsbook, which is really well done. If you gamble and you can, and you don't live in a communist state like me, you should give it a shot. Uh, Mike Davis, like 65 and a half yards, ended up going for like 68 yards. So I nailed that one. And then Antonio Gibson was at 16 and a half yards receiving and went for 19. So very excited. Yay me. Uh, two and oh, we're going to celebrate the wins and not worry about the losses. Like Jameis Winston starting was wrong about that one, but that's all right. Uh, you nailed it with Heineke. Uh, he is uh, Colt McCoy. Some of our older listeners got to see Colt McCoy play. Uh, Heineke is a really good backup and he's going to give you good backup type numbers. So I think you nailed it with, I am not interested in the Washington wide receivers, but, and while Antonio Gibson takes a step back, obviously, because I think the whole offense is going to take a step back. I think Gibson at least remains in that high upside flex. You're going to start him as you have him roll. Uh, and this is just, why would you not bring in Cam on a like game to game veteran minimum contract? I Because, the, the only reason you keep Heineke in there is if you're just throwing the year and you're, and, and I think Washington's too good to do that. Yeah. I, I think the camp, the camp pairing, it we'll see how the, I mean, it's a Thursday night and it's like a, a tough game to throw into, but my guess is Taylor Heineke plays Thursday night because it's quick turnaround because he knows the offense and then they're going to bring in Cam Newton. I just have to think that, that that's the plan moving forward. Uh, finally in the news, Mackay Becton dislocated his kneecap uh, against the uh, Carolina Panthers and is now out four to six weeks, which is a huge blow to a Jets offensive line that uh, didn't look great against Carolina. And Carolina, we talked about before, is not a defense that necessarily we are writing home about. Uh, and uh, they were able to get after Zach Wilson and put pressure on him with pretty – uh, pretty easily. I don't know how you feel, Clark, but personally, uh, my excitement about this Jets offense being a potential fantasy gold mine is dampening by the minute. Yeah, so I get I get tons of things wrong. Uh, so don't think of this as being braggadocious. So <laughs> but the the Jets were really really bad last year, and they're still bad. Um, losing their best offensive lineman when they don't really have that many good ones is obviously going to be a huge hit. But we did see some good things out of Zach Wilson. He, he looked very much like a rookie, but you saw some flashes. But we also saw, I think, what you're going to see this year is Corey Davis, absolute lock for you know 10 targets come hell or high water, and everyone else just huge question mark could give you a zero really easily. Or in garbage time, you know, could, could put up 
a touchdown in a hundred yards if the other team's given up by the time they get their touches. Yeah. I just agree. I, yeah, Corey Davis to the say. moon. Do we want to touch on this right now? Yeah, uh, Corey Davis to the moon. We nailed, like you knew what was coming. You knew what was coming. You saw it in the preseason. You saw it with how they signed, like they, how the money they paid him. He's their number one. I, and we talked about Zach Wilson making play, being able to make plays. Like the first touchdown he threw to Corey Davis, he was out moving on the pocket, chucks it like 40 yards down the field to get the score. And it was uh, on the dot, on the nose. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about, all of these, the, the way that the offensive line played and all the, and the injury to Mekhi Becton is not great when you have a rookie quarterback and you're relying on a system that, you know, Kyle Shanahan, if you're, if you're sending from that system, it's all about the ground game and kind of like play action, explosive plays down the field. And if you don't have an offensive line that can block kind of, kind of dampens everything you want to do along with my spirits. So Becton, he'll be back like late October. It's, uh, the, the, the surgery is not that bad. They basically just have to go in and pluck out a piece of bone that's broken off and the MCL will kind of like take care of itself. Um, I, this kind of volume for Corey Davis is it's just going to be impossible for him to fail. I think he's a like top 15 receiver for the season and he was being drafted as wide receiver 48. And I think that he's like, in terms of how good of a receiver is in the NFL, I don't know, maybe he's like the 20th best number one receiver. Um, but when you're getting this kind of workload, like he, they get to go play New England this week without Stefan Gilmore, like what? No one's going to stop Corey Davis. This is going to be amazing. So, yeah, I'm Davis might end up being like the biggest steal of the draft. I think in halfway PPR formats, he was going as like the wide receiver 48. Corey Davis like, is going to beat that for by 30. The <laughs> Jets, the Jets, five games before their week six by Carolina, which you know, Davis already put numbers on the Patriots. Broncos, Titans, who just got absolutely roasted by Arizona, and then the Falcons. <laughs> Corey, Corey Davis, chance to be the wide receiver one heading into uh, into week uh, week six, which is rather preposterous given the value that you got him at. All right, that's it for the news. And before we move on to our week one overreactions that we actually are believing, I wanted to tell you, dear listeners, about our Patreon, patreon.com slash nerdballff. We have all kinds of perks for those who wish to join, including joining our staff Discord channel to talk football during the season, our staff, our start and sit hotline, uh, which you can ask us your most pressing questions as the week continues forward, and you can be able to submit questions to be answered live on the show. So if you want to support us, which we would wholeheartedly appreciate, whatever you're willing to contribute, go to patreon.com slash nerdballff. All right, with week one, finished we obviously we were recording this uh pre slash during uh monday night football with the ravens playing the raiders but week one's basically done it's a yearly tradition to wildly overreact to what we've seen and make sweeping claims based off of one game uh and they rarely actually play out let's not forget malcolm brown last year who went off for two touchdowns uh in week one and then didn't score again until week seven he was the running back five that first week and then everyone went crazy and it didn't pan out. But that is not to say that you shouldn't ignore everything that happens in week that week one shows us. So we are here to help you figure out what is actionable and what is fake. Uh, we each have a week one overreaction that we believe will be true moving forward for the rest of 2021. Clark, why don't you start us off? So in week one, I you need to react appropriately. You need to not overreact and not underreact. And that's that's really hard to do. We had Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers uh, look like they'd never played football before. Both of those guys are good. They're going to bounce back, right? So that's Will a good example. They? Well, I, More okay, later. it's up for debate. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. So I like to look at how did the team look because we want you know, players that are on good offenses and odd good teams. And we're going to start to shy away from even, you know, potentially superstar teams on teams that just looked really bad. And last year, the Atlanta Falcons looked bad all year they had julio jones and calvin ridley and matt ryan and still looked incredibly dysfunctional and that has very much carried over into this year please for the love of god if you like football do not go back and watch the atlanta versus philadelphia game it's not like philadelphia comes in, comes into the season 
coming off of like 12 regular season wins and a deep run in the playoffs. Philadelphia was freaking terrible last year too. And they looked great against Atlanta. This bodes very poorly for Atlanta moving forward. Calvin Ridley, of course, absolute boss, baller. You're not going to sit him. But I'm, I, the auxiliary pieces in Atlanta are starting to look like hard passes based on what the Falcons did week one. Yeah, they are. The, that offense was struggling mightily, to say the least. And the on the flip side, too, Clark, we talked about this um, when we were talking about some week one matchups that we really liked. It looks like the Falcons defense is also going to yet again be absolute hot trash. Jalen Hurts lit them up um, and looked you graded out as PFS like number two quarterback this this past week uh, because of his showing. And, and, you know, he threw three touchdowns and 300 yards or something like that. So this is going to be I think it's going to be yet again another year where we're always like, all right your quarterback or wide receivers playing the Falcons this week, fire them up. They have a chance to finish as, you know, a top five, top six of that position this week, because uh, yeah, this, this, uh, the secondary is looking like it's going to be a riddled mess once again. Uh, to console any Kyle Pitts drafters, what we're going to do real quick is just talk about the fact that he led the team in slot snaps this week with 19 Russell Gage, supposedly the team's starting slot receiver was one behind him with 18 uh, Pitts also lined up wide 10 times and in line just eight. This is the kind of usage that you want to bank on. And so I would be still targeting him. Uh, he may not beat out like Mark Andrews, like I thought he would, but I, I think he still has a chance to be a top five guy. Um, their offensive line is really, really bad. And that could lead to some problems, but I hope that they just dial the hell up out of uh, play action, like, and, and screens, just like let the rushers come and figure this out and just dish it to the playmakers and let them go. Clark. Yeah. And how about me calling Cordell Patterson <laughs> yes, a real threat to take touches from Mike Davis in the Falcons backfield. I say a lot of stupid things that I for sure know are not going to happen because it's fun and this is supposed to be fun, but I got that one right. There is a yeah. whole stupid Twitter thread about this and it just warmed my cold, bitter heart. Seeing Cordell <laughs> Patterson out there taking third down snaps, goal line snaps, and looking good as the Falcons' number two running back. Cordell Patterson, seven attempts for 54 yards and then two catches for 13 yards. I was so you can't argue with that. You can't argue with that. Last on, on Jordan on the start and sit show last week that Jordan and I do, uh, we had to build a DFS lineup of 30 plus year old players. Cordell Patterson is our starting running back and he got his points, which is more than we thought he was going to do. So uh, that's a definite win. I think uh, I appreciate everyone in my mentions who reached out and, and shared all of the stats that Nick listed about how I shouldn't panic about Kyle Pitts. So I thank you for, for all of that. Yes. Second in targets, fifth in air yards among, among tight ends to start the year. So uh, the, the breakout is coming uh, worry, not people, but I would agree. I agree with Clark where this is an offense where we were like, Oh, Kyle Pitts. I mean, Kyle Pitts and Calvin Ridley, those are the guys, but like Russell Gage, Mike Davis, like all of these guys are going to be, elite fantasy contributors and maybe it's going to be calvin ridley because he's going to get a shit ton of volume kyle pitts hopefully fingers crossed eventually they're certainly deploying him like a very unique weapon uh but that might be it and matt ryan might not be this sneaky qb you know six or above that that some people including myself i mean i thought he had that ceiling possibly in him but that is not uh probably going to play out now uh clark took my took my overreaction that i'm 100 percent in on and overreacted to it saying that you shouldn't even pay attention to it, but I have to pay attention to it. I have to pay attention to the fact that you should worry about Aaron Rodgers and this Packers offense who got looked absolutely lost against the new Orleans saints uh, in their new home of Jacksonville. Rodgers didn't play football at all this off season. And he looked it. He looked like a man who spent his time growing his hair out and hosting Jeopardy, which he did tremendously, both, you know, successful endeavors. Um, but he was nervous in the pocket without Bakhtiari. There was, he was quick to kind of tuck and, and move off of his reads. He was late on some of them. His interception in the red zone to Devontae Adams was entirely he threw the ball way too late, way behind Adams. And that was an easy pick. I mean, that thing was, it was really bad. You watched that tape and it looked awful. Um, two interceptions on the game entirely. I just like, 
I, I'm going to preface everything I'm about to say by saying that this is me projecting and this is all speculation. However, I can I feel like it would be hard to, after spending all off season, basically building a way for you to get away from the team to then come back and like play invested for that team for a year, knowing that you can leave however and whenever you want for maybe greener pastures. Like he looked tuned out. He didn't look quite ready to, to play football. And I understand it's week one. I understand all of these things are true. And, and ultimately Clark, I agree with your point. It is Aaron Rodgers. It is Devonte Adams. This is an offense that we saw was one of the best offenses in the league last year. And I think it could get to that point, but it might take a little bit longer than we initially anticipate. And I'll say it like this. I won't be ranking Devonte Adams as the wide receiver one anytime soon in, in our weekly ranks. I think that, uh, that until we see it, Devonte Adams is probably going to be out of my top five uh, from here on out. Well, Devonte Adams fans aren't going to have to wait long because the Green Bay Packers travel to Detroit to take on the Lions and Monday Night Football next week. Uh, we will. Nothing gets you back on track like playing Detroit. So. Right. I know it looked like Detroit played San Francisco close. They did not. Uh, the 49ers did everything they could to try to give that game away. And I think they still covered depending on when you put your action down, like eight or nine points. Uh, yeah. I, I think the bigger reaction here is shit. The saints are not taking a year off transitioning from Drew Brees. No, Jameis Winston looking everything you thought he could be. Well, and the defense looked really good. So the unfortunately, the good. NFL, in their fucking brilliance, has decided that the all-22 footage, which allows you to actually see what's happening on the game, is not something that NFL Game Pass fans want anymore. No. But all of the cutaways that they showed of the Green Bay wide receivers were they were covered. They were and then it and then Aaron Rodgers very much looked like he gave up about halfway through the third quarter as well. So which he's been prone thing. to do. Let's let's reflect on Tampa Bay last year when uh when he just kind of gave up halfway through the game. So, so you guys last year were big on the Aaron Rodgers revenge narrative. And then and it worked. he was, he was going to just tear it up. This is my Aaron Rodgers revenge narrative, which is that he is still just experiencing residual effects from taking LSD at Joshua tree with miles <laughs> Teller. He's just out here to have a good time. Maybe he'll try, uh, you know, if it's like a division rivalry or something like that. But I think the, the real Aaron Rodgers revenge is that he got these guys to trade back for Randall. He's he, who then he didn't the see any to time to yeah. do anything week one. Right. He, no, he's just here to have a good time. He doesn't really care about winning. He's kind of just going to chill for the rest of the year. Um, I want to let me quickly see if I could find it in a, in live because Jordan, tw I think Jordan tweeted this out and it was hilarious. And it's just the fact that, Rogers trying to give the Packers the first overall pick is a nice parting gift. So clearly things are going well for Jordan and, uh, and Packers fans everywhere. Nick, uh, what's an overreaction from week one that you are, you're buying in on. Uh, so this is uh, partly a, a celebration in, uh, of me and then partially a, a mea culpa. Uh, my overreaction is that the lion's backfield is here to stay. Oh, uh, what a rare, what a rare moment to be able to not only like celebrate your correct call, but then also be like, I also recognize I was wrong. That's well, it's, a, it's a key coaching thing, you know, <laughs> like you're, you're like, Hey, good job, kid work on this, but you did a good job here. I'm just doing that for myself. So I stay a beat. <laughs> so you, so you've turned it now also to complimenting yourself as being a good coach for yourself. You're, you're sky high, Nicholas sky high to it, start the year. <laughs> it takes a big man to admit when he was wrong and I was wrong. <laughs> so, so Jamal Williams, I was like, I was so in on Jamal Williams as a late round guy after Anthony Lynn was like, he's my A back, blah, 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 which basically meant that he was Melvin Gordon and might actually like start over Swift, which he did this week, but Swift was still dealing with the groin injury. So, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I was kind of out on Swift. I figured he would just kind of get like the older school Eckler role where he's he's really not like a featured guy I mean mm -hmm. he's like 40 percent featured in the backfield but not like what he was this week um, there's an old adage that you basically need to be able to uh, beat your opponent with with three different players and typically that's a receiver a uh, running back and maybe a tight end or, or two receivers but the way Anthony Lynn likes to do that is two running backs and a tight end 
and uh and you know it's gonna end up like a loss like it did this week but <laughs> you won't win games but you'll win fantasy games right and so i mean the usage that these two guys saw was like it was one it was fantastic and two it was sustainable so jamal williams nine carries nine targets like that is totally reasonable for him to get on a weekly basis Maybe it was a little bit exasper- uh, exasperated or exaggerated uh, with DeAndre Swift, 11 carries and 11 targets. But looking at the schedule, Green Bay, they should push the pace on them. Baltimore should do the same. Chicago, okay, maybe not. But Minnesota, I mean, they've got a lot of matchups that either they're facing a good offense or they have a good matchup. And, like, I think they're just going to have to keep the pedal to the metal with these two guys. They got nothing out of Tyrell Williams. And I don't – if what does that, that say about Rashad Perryman if they – cut him but but kept Tyrell Williams um but yeah I, I think that this backfield can own like 35 or more touches per week and they're it's going to be really hard not to rank them as running back twos for the foreseeable future for sure yeah also Jared Goff sneaky like fantasy winner oh he's just dumping off like crazy wow. I mean, I that was, the guy the guy had 57 attempts, and, and I have a hard time thinking that he's not going to average at least like 35 attempts this season because the lies are going to suck all the time. I think everything we in quotes thought about the Lions came true, except for the scoring volume, which was a bit of a surprise. But again, San Francisco really phoned in the fourth quarter and gave the Lions a chance to come back. Nick, you nailed it. Um, Williams got a lot of work and then Swift, you know, got a lot of work as well. Pretty much an even split from those guys just watching the game. It at least felt like that. DeAndre Swift looked incredibly electric again. So all all those folks who took a shot on Swift and his athleticism, despite worries about Detroit being able to find a way to squander that Swift was cutting and making guys look silly. He was running away from dudes. So Big sigh of relief for all of those uh, Swift drafters out there. Oh, and TJ Hawkinson got the ball like every time. TJ Hawkinson, <laughs> 10 targets. <laughs> yeah. So I do want to, I want to add this and then I'll, I'll shut up. But like, I, I, there are a couple of people you like to give props to, you know, go check out their feeds. Dwayne McFarlane, his usage stuff that's totally free is friggin' awesome. And one thing that he highlighted with Swift Swift was in a route on 63% of the Lions passing plays today. That is Kamara-esque. And he details when, when running backs run routes on between 60 and 70% of a team's dropbacks. Most of the time, it, like on a season-long perspective in, in full point PPR, they're finishing as a top five running back. So like Swift's ceiling here, if he continues this kind, this, this like percentage of usage is phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, all right. Since both of you guys completely shatted on my uh, Green Bay Packers overreaction is being is being correct, uh, you did, Clark. Don't give me that face. You, you oh, I did. It. I thought Nick agreed with you that Aaron Rodgers had moved on to the, his exploratory phase of his well, life. Nick, yeah. Well, Nick was like high. Aaron Rodgers is high as a kite constantly now, and then he gets to play the Lions. So who knows what? Who knows where Nick's at right now? Um, I also want to quickly say this was my original one that I moved on to the Packers because I had to talk about him. Uh, I'm glad we all panicked about Jamar Chase and and absolutely freaked out that he forgot how to catch a football. And then for when he plays with his college quarterback and bestest buddy, uh, goes for 100 plus yards and a touchdown. So glad that it happened. Glad that most of the news is just made up for clicks. It's very true. It is very true. We do not abide in that. We just create clicks with news. We well. We report things that matter we with report. integrity. <laughs> you can trust us. That's the nerd ball motto. Um, all right, let's talk waiver wire ads. If you had one person to add off of waivers, who are you adding? Clark, we already spent a little bit of time on your guy, but let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about Elijah Mitchell a bit more. This one's simple. You know, we we saw some injuries, but we didn't see any clear injuries where the absolutely number two guy is going to take over. The closest thing we saw to that was Elijah Mitchell. Uh, There's some question about whether or not it's going to be Sermon coming in and playing a big role, but he's likely not available. I think Elijah Mitchell has owned her rostered in like 3% of leagues. So uh, when I wrote my waiver article, I said, you know, maybe 10, 15% of fab. Now that we know Mostert's going to be out for at least eight weeks, I feel like he's a 20 to 30 
percent of your fab budget guy and if you're super desperate at running back this might be one of the better shots you have of picking up someone that can help your team all season yeah i i think that i think that even given the speculation about what trace herman's role is going to be in this offense we've seen the fact that the 40 that like, like kyle shanahan's backfields do rotate through backs. He does like to get a bunch of backs involved. And even if Trey Sermon ultimately come week, I don't even know, six, seven, eight, like this is a long ass season now with that extra week. Uh, like even if, if by like week eight, it's Trey Sermon's backfield, he's getting the majority of touches. First of all, you probably got seven good weeks out of Mitchell, which is saying a lot, especially this early in the season. And secondly, if Mitchell plays well, there's no way that Shanahan's just going to be like, okay, you're done. Sit on the bench for the rest of the, you know, 10 games of the season. He'll, he'll get plays here and there. And with his speed, he has a chance to always, uh, always be involved and always put up fantasy numbers. Uh, if you are in a quarterback bind, Jameis Winston has to be the guy you are going to get. We've talked about it. We've seen Jameis Winston last year or two years ago. Sorry. When he was starting for Tampa, he finished as what the, he was a top three quarterback in fantasy, despite the fact that he threw 30 interceptions. Um, and I have to say, I know, I know uh, <laughs> uh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman mentioned this a couple of times. Jameis Winston, that LASIK surgery uh, was not th- forcing passes. And I don't know if that's the Sean Payton effect. I don't know if that's the LASIK effect, but he was, he was, Taking, he was throwing the ball out of play rather than forcing it downfield, which is something that's new to Jameis's game. Uh, he had what four touch, five touchdowns on very little passing work, um, and so hyper efficient. You, if you loved Sean Payton's offense before, and you're adding this quarterback who can make every single throw on the field, including he threw a monster rainbow uh, to, to uh, Deontay Harris for for a big touchdown that really kind of put the game out of reach for the Packers. Jameis Winston, he's I think he's under 50% rostered currently in sleeper app, uh, but that's going to skyrocket. If you are either a quarterback bind or if you're in a super flex, go get Jameis Winston. Yeah, I think it was Ian Harditz that was saying there have been like 200, uh, you know, occurrences of five touchdown performances in the NFL, and Winston's 148 passing yards were the fewest. 20, 20 <laughs> attempts. He had 14 completed passes and he's five <laughs> of those were for touchdowns. That's absurd. <laughs> That's, That's amazing. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they may just have their quarterback of the next like 10 years. Um, I was a little disappointed in Marquez Callaway, not showing out. He was, I think targeted on like the first two plays of the game and then just was super quiet after that. And I don't know if that was patience on Winston's part and just like not trying to force it to somebody or if Callaway, you know, was not what we thought he was in the preseason, but um, overall, yeah, I, I, I endorse this pick. Go add Winston if you need a QB. No. Yeah. And really just watching the game takeaway was really pleased seeing Winston looks super trim. Uh, he's always he been was- a, a big guy and I don't mean fat, but he's always been like very well filled out. He looked very trim. And that showed in his rushing ability a couple of times when things broke down. I'm not going to say that he looked like a gazelle running around out there. Uh, looked a little bit more like old crazy legs. But anyway, got some yards and picked up some some tough yardage. Six and oh. oh, six carries for 37 yards. Yeah, and, and I was very very excited to see that he did well throwing the ball to Alvin Kamara, which is just such a huge piece of this offense, and he was able to execute that. So I was really really pleased with what we saw out of Winston keeping in mind with really with no one to throw to. So, (laughs) you know, the sky, you know, I know they had a good game and and God, they just trounced the Packers and it's, it's easy to look good when you're doing that, but uh, sky's the limit for, for new Orleans again. Yeah, no, things are, things are well, sports wise, things are looking, looking up in the Bayou, obviously with uh, the natural world uh, going on out there. We hope that, Everything also goes well. Well, they're due for a Super Bowl next year by the weather. That's that's true. Uh, just as like the Packers are due for a Super Bowl this year, uh, because to start the 2020 season in Week One, the Saints beat the Buccaneers 38 to three, and so the Bucks went on to win the Super Bowl. Clearly, the Packers will go on to win the Super Bowl uh, this year. That is science. Nick, who's your top waiver ad before we go? It's Cole Beasley, uh, who is like 52 percent rostered on yahoo and under 50 percent on sleeper 
in all of the offseason hubbub of trying to figure out whether or not Emmanuel Sanders or Gabe Davis was going to be the other prominent Bills wide receiver, people just, one, I think kind of forgot about Beasley or didn't take him seriously. And then two, a lot of people got really upset with his thoughts on COVID and the vaccine and just didn't draft him. And this dude got 13 targets in week one. Like he, he's the number two yeah. in Buffalo. Stephon Diggs got 14. Beasley was at 13. He, and they do like to target him um, at a higher rate in like zone defense matchups. And so there might be some weeks where man coverage, Beasley kind of gets left out and, you know, hung to dry. But like when you have someone who can see 10 targets per week, like average that on the season or eight at worst in the Bills offense, you need to have this guy on your roster. This is like he he needs to be at an over 90 percent. Yes. Roster ship uh, threshold. Yeah. He's a, he's a locked in at the very, very floor, a like high end flex guy. And his ceiling is wide receiver one. Like he, there's no reason why he should be on the waiver wires. Yeah. I hate it when I can't remember who said something, but this was kind of at the beginning of last year. And someone pointed out when the game is tough, Josh Allen throws to Cole Beasley a lot because mm-hmm. Cole Beasley gets open six yeah. yards away from the line of scrimmage. He catches the ball and he gets up field. When the game is not close and Josh Allen's having fun and he's he's airing it out there, I think that's going to be when we see more the Emmanuel Sanders role. But, Nick, I agree with you. Cole Beasley's kind of like a wide receiver three slash flex play, and you're just looking for someone, if your league is, you know, 12 teams or more, you're just looking for someone that's going to get usage, and then you're crossing your fingers that it's kind of an up week when you play him. And Beasley's Beasley's – good right like he's not the best wide receiver in the league but he's very talented and his quarterback loves to throw to him um clark when the bills are winning who has more fun josh allen or aaron Rodgers on shrooms i i mean i think you have to go with the latter I would like every assume. time right yeah I, I feel like the drug-induced uh, excitement could be Unless he has a really bad trip, which what a surprising game though. Like who had the Pittsburgh Steelers defense dominates the bills and the Steelers pick up the win in week one. Who had that in the pool? I picked them. Like, I picked the, I picked the Steelers to win like, this week, but, but yeah, not no, just the, the Steelers same defense came out and looked great. They looked great. TJ Watt, like after getting that monster deal came in and started wreaking havoc, like this Steelers defense, like this Steelers team in general, I feel like, it was a lot of the AFC North hubbub was all about the Ravens, all about the Browns. And we'll see the Ravens tonight. The Browns, like the Browns went toe to toe with the chiefs. And if not for like Baker Mayfield's uh, um, throwaway, getting kind of shorthanded because he got tackled and getting picked, at the, you know, at the could have been a game could have, you know, they could have gone down to something. I think the Steelers people are, People are like, oh, Ben Roethlisberger is actually shot, and he could be. But this is Steelers. The Steelers are a much more exciting team than I think people maybe have given them credit for heading into this year. Yeah. So speaking of defenses, kind of a like, I just love to shoehorn all of these in. The Cardinals looked really good. Woo! And speaking of defenses, and speaking of Watts, uh, we saw what was it, Chandler Jones? Chandler Jones, five sacks, baby, five sacks. Okay, so he did that, and you have to give him credit, one hundred percent, full stop. When there is more than one good defensive lineman on the team. It makes things very, very difficult on the opposing offensive line. JJ Watt isn't, you know, perennial defensive player of the year like he used to, but you saw him in this game. He was super active. He demanded a lot of attention and that just makes things super easy for everyone or it makes things a lot easier for people around you. And so that's why I have the Cardinals DST as a pickup this week. They're only 30% rostered and uh, their next couple of games are pretty good. You know, they're going to go up against the Bengals, you know, they can play the Jaguars. So the, something you might want to take a look at those easy points where you don't have to yeah. spend a lot of your free agent budget for. That's a great, that's a great call. And they're a great DFS option too. Uh, Cause they'll probably routinely be priced on the lower end of the spectrum. Cause they're not, uh, household name. Uh, I apologize, you guys. And I apologize to your listeners. I lied. I said, we're going to end with waiver wire. We are not going to end with waiver wire. We are going to end who with the motherfucking wheel, because we have two wheel bets that we have to spin for in order to start the year off. Right. That is right. We had uh, Clark's in my bet about Taysom Hill starting for the saints 
in week one. Clark tried to push it back as long and as far oh, as possible. I fully <laughs> at kickoff was hoping, please, Sean Payton, be stupid just, and give just... me one Taysom Hill snap right away. Like, but alas, no. Uh, I was all ready to, to to make like an argument about that. It's not who who gets the first snap, but who gets the most snaps. Uh, and then Nick made a bet with Clark that Aaron Rodgers will not be on the Packers uh, and will not be their QB come week one. And that clearly didn't play out because Aaron Rodgers was the worst quarterback in fantasy for the Packers. So we have two wheels to spin. Uh, we will, shall I, shall I read what we have available or should we just spin blindly and you guys, you guys get to just come when whatever happens. Let's fire away. All right. We're firing away. Cue I the think music. while the wheel is spinning, Nick and I side bet. Can we can just offset, right? Unacceptable. I lost, you lost. And then unacceptable. No punishment. Wow. Right? I don't, I don't, all I don't even un- know what you're saying, but look at it, all of this undermining that is going on. All right. For this it. Let's fun go. I will bet on anything. I don't. You really will, Nick. Nick's a great person to make wheel bets with. It's amazing. Uh, half this list is just Nick being like, yeah, I'll take that. Okay, here we go. Spin. And does it really count that Aaron Rodgers like was the starter if he didn't show up to play? Uh? Uh, uh. That's really more of an existential question than we'll probably get <laughs> well, to here. Well, high, <laughs> high ass Aaron Rodgers is really contemplating that right now. High on shrews Rodgers. That's what he's talking about. All right. Uh, who did I just spin for? Let's say I spun for Clark. Clark, your punishment for this bet about Taysom Hill starting his week one quarterback is that uh, your parents or significant other Get to set your fantasy lineup this week in a league oh, you care about. No. Okay. So that's so that is Clark's punishment, and we spin for Katie. Helped me with uh, Marvin Jones over Odell Beckham. She oh, made the right call. Wow. Marvin All Jones's right, well. name is better, so we went with him. Odell Beckham sat. Marvin Jones got like eighteen points, so she's basically a better so, analyst than wow, I. Wow, she's so so. Actually, this could benefit Clark. Clark could start his uh, his fantasy season uh, really strongly. Nick. You just have to eat a spoonful of mustard on tomorrow on next week's show. Oh my god! <laughs> a big, right. a big heaping spoonful of mustard oh, for Nicholas. This could be so spicy on next week's show. That is the wheel. The wheel has spoken. All right, and with that, we are now officially done. That's all we got for you this week. Please rate and subscribe to the podcast and your podcast platform of choice, and make sure you follow us on Twitter at NerdballFF. You can follow myself on Twitter at Pete M. Rogers. Follow Clark at NFL Clark and Nick at Ginger underscore underscore Nick without a K. And of course, the season is fully upon us. We have all kinds of content coming at you at nerdballff.com. I have dropped a list of early waiver wire targets like Clark alluded to. Clark is dropping a top five uh, waiver wire priority players that will be dropping it tomorrow. So make sure you go check that out. Um, and as always, stay Nerdy, I guess. And until next week.